and today is the day. So right now, I would like to welcome up Veronica, who is our preschool director, and the families that are participating today. So come on up. Come up. Come up. Good morning, church. Good morning. So here at Victor Valley Christian Church, we believe that children are a gift from God. These families are here to publicly commit to lead and spiritually nurture their child in cooperation, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Sorry. So their child can develop a desire to love God and love others. Parent-child dedication is scripturally based in both the Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, we see Hannah, a mom who begs God for a son, and when she receives him and dedicates him back to God, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple. They dedicate him to the Lord and his purposes. Being a parent is an awesome responsibility bestowed upon us by God. The Bible gives us an outline for how we are to raise up children and follow God's plan. The writings of Moses found in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, describes God's plan for how a parent should raise up a child. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, while you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. There was a study done that asked over 250,000 Christian teens who had a strong faith, what were the things that influenced them to have the life-impacting faith that they had? Reason number one was moms. Reason number two was their dads. Moms and dads are two to three times more influential than any church program. The average church only has 40 hours in a given year to influence a child's life. The average parent has over 3,000 hours. With this knowledge that parents are key to growing children's faith, then what is the role of the church? Our job is three things, to equip the parents and guardians to pass the faith to their children to reestablish the home as the primary place where faith is nurtured, to be a lifelong partner with you and your family. So now allow me to introduce our families. We have Jason and Ashley McCoy, McLaughlin, sorry. They're here today along with their older children, Avon, Asher, and Maverick, to dedicate baby McCoy. There he is up on the screen, it's so cute. We have Shane and Marissa Cottrell, and they are here with Big Brother Carson, and they're dedicating little Ellie, Elizabeth. And we have Evan and Belinda Stelling, and they are here today to dedicate their grandchildren, Bradley and Ryder. And we have Garrett and Megan Kelly, and they are here today with big sister Ava to dedicate baby Oliver. So parent-child dedication is an opportunity for three groups of people. If you are sitting here today and are a part of these groups, we will ask you to make a commitment to these children, their families, and their spiritual growth and development. The first group we are going to ask a commitment from is our parents. So today we will ask you to affirm your dedication to your family and, these, and their spiritual growth. If you agree to the statements, please say I do. Do 
do you receive this child with gratitude as God's gift to you and your family? Do you commit to each other as parents, creating a stable environment in which your child can mature? Will you make a covenant to strengthen your marriage relationship? Do you commit to be parents of personal faith, recognizing your children are more likely to follow God's path by the model they first observe in you? Do you commit to lead a faith-filled home that honors God in all your relationships and the choices you make in spiritually growing your family? Do you commit to be parents with patience, recognizing that with your inherent strengths and weaknesses, your desire to shape your child is a loving act that will require time, prayer, and God in order to produce in your children what he, ha what he and you hope for. And the second group we are going to ask a commitment from is the extended family and friends of those committing their future to Christ. Today we ask you to affirm your support to these families and their spiritual growth. If you agree, please affirm the following statements with, we will. As the families of these children and parents, will you do your part to support and encourage them that they may be godly parents? Will you stand by them as they raise their children in the love of Christ? Thank you. The final group we're going to ask a commitment from is our church family. Today we will ask you to affirm your dedication to these families and their spiritual growth. If you agree, please affirm the following statements with, we will. We are a family full of many hearts and hands whom God has drawn together in a family of faith. Within the church of Jesus Christ, no parent stands alone. We are here to help bear this awesome and exciting responsibility of raising children. As the body of Christ, will you pray for these families and help in providing a Christian community that will lead these children into a healthy relationship with Christ, their parents, and the church? If so, thank you. And now Tammy's going to come pray. Will you all stand with me while we pray for these families? Father, we are just so thankful that you placed us in family units, God. I just pray for each of these families that they will continue to seek you, continue to be the example that you want them to be and to teach them about you. God, I also pray for the extended family, God, that you will just help them to come alongside and to just help in this endeavor as sometimes it gets very difficult parenting in the world we live in. God, I thank you so much for this church, those who are dedicated to serving in our children's ministries and our preschool ministries, and those that just come alongside as friends and just help these families. I pray, God, that we will continue to be a source of support and comfort as we help them continue to seek you as well, God. We just look forward to watching these children grow. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, families. Amen. Well, as we just remain standing, Lord, we just invite you into this place right now. We just want to worship you this morning. All right, here we go. Let's sing. Let praise be the weapon. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise, let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are, we claim. 
like, let's show it. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven to meet with you. We have come here to see you. We have come here to feel you, Lord. So we open up our hearts right now, Lord. We just say yes. Yes to whatever you're doing, Lord. We love you. Just keep your heart postured towards him this morning. Let's sing this. All things have passed. The same, your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine.
on, just pour it out. Pour out of your word. In our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. In our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. We love you. Oh, how. voice he's so worthy oh how we love yes you are the one we're gonna sing it again and this time just picture him right in front of you Jesus we love sing it right to him Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy.
this promise this morning. I will build my life. And I will. Please be seated. This is the time in our service that we set aside a few minutes each week to remember the sacrifice that was made for each of us. In 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, the Apostle Paul writes, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Every lash that Jesus took from the Roman soldier, he took for us. When they punched him in the face and forced that crown of thorns on top of his head, he did that for us. And when he died on that cross, he did that for us. So when you take the bread that represents his broken body and the cup that represents his shed blood, remember those sacrifices, that ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made for you and I. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much that we can take this time to remember the sacrifice that was made by Jesus for us. But Lord, we pray that we would remember this every moment of our lives. Be with us as we partake, Lord, I pray in Christ's name, amen.
As, you, as we start to prepare our hearts for Robbie to come forward and share the word, we have a couple of announcements. I want to remind you, those of you who give faithfully, it is incredible. The ministries that this church has participated in when the world stopped. And I want to encourage you, we have hope for McGurry. We still have some orphans that need to be adopted over there in McGurry, Kenya, and they need your help. And I want to encourage you to think about that. And those of you who continue to support them, that's awesome. If you want to give this morning, there are three ways we're doing it at this time. There's black boxes in the back for those of you who wish to give in person. For those of you who do it online, of course, vvc.com. Um, is a great way to do that. We have a bill pay system, or you can mail it or drop it by the church. Lots of information on our website. Also, if you're visiting with us this morning, we're so glad you brought your Sunday with us and you decided to hang out with us today. At the end of the service, we have a lovely gift. We'd love to get to know you back over there under Guest Central. Tammy will be there to meet you and talk to you, and we have prayer requests. And if you have prayer requests, please feel free to put them on those cards, and you can put those in those black boxes as well. Also, don't forget Stater Brothers cards. If you shop at Stater Brothers and you use these cards, you get your value and the church actually gets a little bit back as Stater Brothers tries to make inroads into their community. And don't forget, women, the well is going on. This new study, Matchless, that's Thursdays here at 10 or Thursdays at 6. So you have two options or you can come twice if you're like me and you just need to be in Bible study twice because you need to hear it twice. Also, youth. You can go now. I wanted to say that because they are. Youth, you're dismissed. And as they're leaving, I want to remind you, youth, that we're having that get air, that trampoline thing is coming for the high school and junior high. And we're going to give Nerf guns to our junior kids. I don't know why we're doing that, but we are. And there's information out there for them if you want to. And don't forget, there is a bake sale going on. And they're going to a conference that some of these kids need help. So remember, as you leave today, buy a cookie for the way home because you need it. So let's just open our hearts, and my friend, it's all for you. If you could, let's just pray for Robbie as he comes forward. Let's just pray. Father God, we just lay our hearts before you as your word is unfurled. Father God, we have worshipped you in song. We have worshipped you in communion. Father God, we have worshipped you in just surrounding our children with love. And now, Father God, we just pray as Robbie brings the word that it is not his word we hear, Father God. It is not his dynamics that we work on, Father God, but it is the Holy Spirit that comes inside of our hearts and says, Says now is the time for action. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I want to teach you a word. Euangelion. Now, if your ears are saying that's Greek to me, you are correct. That is a Greek word. Say that with me. Euangelion. Now, while saying, while saying that word might not be abundantly familiar, the meaning behind that word might be. It's the word for gospel that we use on a regular basis. But I want to suggest that sometimes I think we lose the power of the actual concrete meaning of that word euangelion or gospel. Now, we do get it right when we translate it good news because that's literally what euangelion means, good news. But I think sometimes we slip into using it in kind of a general way. We talk about the gospel truth, right? Meaning something is kind of very, very true. We talk about gospel music, meaning a certain style of music. Or we talk about presenting the gospel, which means you've shown someone, here's the way in which the process, the decisions you make, you go through to become a Christian. But I want to challenge us to think about it in its most original and concrete terms because I think that brings insight into exactly what is happening in the New Testament in the arrival of Jesus. You know, Luke chapter 2 talks about this, right? The angel says, I bring you good news of great joy. That's the essence of what Scripture is revealing when it's revealing the gospel, it's revealing good news. So when we think about the tangibleness of that word euangelion and good news, it's news that arrives in a historical context. Now, I know that sounds a little boring. That sounds like Professor Phillips is up here, and I will be in and out of this sermon, but I think it's valuable to learn some of these lessons. It, news comes in a historical context so that Matthew begins his gospel not once upon a time. Instead, he begins his gospel 
This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And while at first read, that may sound like Yon City, let me skip ahead to some of the action in the story that I'm reading. There's a great value and a tangibleness and a historical rootedness uh, that exists in the gospel, the good news. And that's why Matthew says, let me start by telling you the genealogy of Jesus Christ. I want you to see his lineage. I want you to see his family tree. I want you to see the larger narrative, the historical context. I want you to be able to verify and test and look at these sorts of things. So it's just like the difference between me saying, well, once upon a time versus saying on Main Street, Tuesday around noon, I was with Jim. He works for the police department. You know Jim. Here's his number. You can call him and verify this. Here's what happened. Do you see the difference between that and once upon a time? Uh, the gospel is this good news that's announced in a historical context, rooted in a historical context. Imagine today if it was announced that North Korea came to the mic, and we know North Korea is this dictatorship. We know this history, this context of North Korea. If they came to the mic and announced, we are repenting and recanting all of our oppressive rule of our people. We're, we're de-weaponizing ourselves as a nation. We're going to focus instead on the humanitarian needs of our people. That would be amazing good news. And we would understand why it's good news because of the historical context, because we know the history, that we know what else has happened. We know about North Korea's oppression of its people and its continual conflict and border with South Korea and, and the potential instability of its leadership. Because we know all of that historical context, we hear that news in the tangible good news way in which it's intended to be heard. So first, the gospel is good news that's announced in a historical context. Second, it's good news about something that is happening that is changing everything. So it's great news. It's grand news. It's not your toast is ready, okay? It's not that level of news. It is this amazing news, this news that changes everything. To keep using the same analogy, we understand if North Korea made that announcement, it would be this huge news. It wouldn't be this little news like we've developed something uh, to make a car run a little bit quieter. It would be this amazing news that this whole regime is changing and that all these people's lives will be impacted forever. And that's the way the good news of the gospel in Scripture is. In Romans chapter 10, Paul says the gospel, the euangelion, if you hear it and believe it and accept it, your life will be changed now and forever. Now and forever, your life will be completely changed because of the nature of the good news. In Romans 16 and in Romans 1, Paul says the euangelion is God's power unto salvation for you and I. He's using the euangelion, the good news is the way in which God is accomplishing or establishing salvation for you and I. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Before the very foundations of this earth, God was looking for the euangelion. He was looking ahead at the plan he had through Christ to redeem you and I, that that good news goes back that far and that deep, that it's God's plan in our life and in our hearts to work this amazing miracle First Peter, it talks about the angels longing to understand the good news. In the original language, I love it, it's this image of the angels leaning in. They're, they're, God is orchestrating this plan through Christ, this euangelion, and the angels are like, what is this? What is he going to do? How is this going to happen through his son? They're leaning in to understand what the prophets didn't even understand. They knew that God would redeem one day, but they weren't sure how, and now it's coming true through in Christ. So it's this amazing good news that will change our life forever. And third, the gospel introduces a now and a still yet to come reality. And again, we'll keep using the North Korea analogy. Even though that announcement could be made, we know that there would be this reality. We've made this commitment. 
but there will be a time in which that commitment is unfolded and made real, right? A time in which weapons are removed and taken away. A time in which government officials are replaced or retrained. A time in which people are treated in a humanitarian way and food is provided and shelter is made. Even though it would be announced and it would be this reality, there would be a time period in which it becomes real. It becomes this sort of reality. And that's how the New Testament talks about the euangelion, the good news. It's this both now and yet to come fully news, this announcement of the good news. So that in the New Testament, it is proclaimed with objective, absolute, existential, real world, right now authority that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul says that throughout his letters. That's proclaimed by those who understand the gospel and believe it even in the gospels. Jesus is Lord. And at the same time in Philippians 2, Paul says, One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because we're in between that announcement of that reality and that reality being fully revealed. Fully revealed who we are, the kingdom of God people, we are those who have heard the euangelion. If you're a Christian, if you follow Christ, you've heard the good news and you've believed it. And so right now, we are those who say, this is the truest thing about the universe. This is reality one-on-one. Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm living my life to the best of my ability, imperfectly at times, but I'm living my life to the best of my ability to live out that reality that Jesus is Lord, to obey Him, to submit to Him, to follow Him, to live as if what He says is true because it is true, to live based on the reality of the world He describes, a reality where He says it is better uh, to serve than to be served. And so we strive to live out that sort of reality, this kingdom of God among us, this good news that says it's no longer power in the hands of humanity and wealth in the hands of humanity that determines greatness and oppresses other, others. Instead, God flips that it's on his head and Jesus becomes the suffering Savior, the servant who redeems, the one who washes his disciples' feet and says, you do the same. And he says, those who are humble will be exalted. Those who are poor in spirit will be blessed. And we are striving to live out that reality as believers, as those who have heard the gospel and believed it. Now, all of this may sound familiar, but I want us to take the implications to a little bit of a deeper level. When you look at that word euangelion, one of the ways it's used in the New Testament and in the culture out of which it arose is when a king and a nation would be faced with this threat from another nation so that another nation would announce, we are coming to conquer you with our armies. And that was a real world terror in that day. There were kings and kingdoms that rose and fell. The Greeks took over everything so that Alexander would say, there's no more lands to conquer and shed a tear. And then the Romans took over everything and Roman authority suppressed everyone. It was not bizarre to have that announcement that we are coming to conquer you with our troops. And then the king would say to the people who are terrified inside the walls of the city, I'm going out with the army to meet these troops and defeat them so that we are safe. Now imagine, imagine if we, if today, if it was announced, planes are coming. The terror that would fill us. Armies are approaching. But if our leader said, we're going with our troops, we're going to stop them before they get to our borders, before they get to our, we would be leaning in, wouldn't we? We'd be wondering what's going to happen. The same way in those ancient days, people waited anxiously to find out, was the king victorious? Did he succeed? And guess what? When the king was victorious, when he defeated that approaching army, he would send back to the village, he would send back to the city inside those walls, you on Galeongers, those who would bring 
good news. That's where the word comes from. They would arrive back and say, listen, the king has been victorious. Our enemies have been defeated. We are safe. We are saved. That's the gospel, the good news. But what would happen if the king was defeated? The messengers would come back and it would be a different message, wouldn't it? They wouldn't be come back, coming back announcing good news. Instead, they would arrive in panic, in anxiety, in worry, and in fear, dishing out advice. Look, we, it, it's, it's, it's over. Look, everybody who can hold a, a stick or a club or a stone, go get it now because they're coming. And we'll be lucky just to survive and make it as slaves and not be slaughtered in this approaching en enemy. And so they'd be saying, look, you need to shore up that part of the wall and you need to get every weapon you can. And you need to make sure you store up some supplies and put the women and children over. All of this advice would be distributed because of this anxiety, this fear, this worry. When we understand euangelion, we realize that the gospel is the announcement of good news, not advice. But too often, I think the way we actually live out our faith and live as a church in the culture, we, we treat it as if the message is advice, right? An announcement is this news about something, has been, something that has been completed, something that's been done. Advice is what you must do. And how often is the gospel, is the message of the church perceived as, here's what you must do. We've talked about this. We should all over ourselves and others. You should do this. You should do that. You need to do this. You need to do that. And it's ultimately what you must do to save yourselves. Right? Pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps. We slip into thinking of, well, we're good people and those people out there are bad people. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was in a prison camp in Russia, simply for writing things against leadership under dicta dictatorial leadership. He was beaten and imprisoned on a regular basis. He was the good guy. They were the bad guys. But he says he remembers this moment when the guard was standing over him, beating him merciless for no reason. And he thought, if I could just have that club, if I could be the one standing over you, I, oh, I. And he said in that moment he realized that the line between good and evil, he said, oh, we wish we could think of good and evil this way. We wish we could think of evil as something in other people over there. And if we can just stop them from doing evil. But instead, he said, I realized in that moment that the line between good and evil runs right down the middle of every human heart. So that how can you confront evil without confronting yourself at the same time? And too often we slip into this false thinking of saying, well, here's the gospel, here's the message. You need to straighten up and fly right. You need to fix yourself. And there's no hope. There's no ability to divide ourselves. Well, we're the good folks who behave properly, and the other humans over there are the bad folks. We're all in that dilemma. The enemy is coming, and there's no possibility of our winning that battle. And we slip into mis the mistake of thinking the gospel is advice when instead it is good news. It's the announcement that Jesus has won the victory. Think about the implications of that. It's the announcement of what has already been accomplished, that he has provided the victory, not advice about what we must do, but instead the announcement that human brokenness and evil and frailty does not have the last word. Amen? We live in this period that is the announcement of that good news, and it's not fully realized yet, but that is our faith that Jesus Christ is Lord, that his work on the cross provides righteousness and salvation, that it makes true that statement that sin and brokenness do not have the last word in our lives as a people, in our lives individually. So your sin, if you trust in Jesus Christ, does not 
have the last word about you. Amen? Oh, the adversary wants it to be. He whispers in her ear, doesn't he? He whispers in her ear constantly, you're no good. This is your identity. Your identity is your sin. Your identity is your brokenness. Your identity is your frailty. And he whispers that over and over. You need to be scared. You, you are so, I can't believe you did that. You, li- listen, you need to get a stick or a club or shore up because the enemy's coming. Judgment is coming. And suddenly we've slipped into not believing the good news. And instead we're living this life of good advice. Where we're trying to save ourselves and we're constantly on this yo-yo, this roller coaster. I'm good with God. I'm bad with God. I'm good with God. I'm... Can anybody relate to this? You have a good week. You read your Bible every day, seven days in a row. You pray. You get tingles on the back of your neck when you pray. Worship's especially good. And you think, I'm good. I'm good. And then you have seven days in a row where you forget to read your Bible. And worship doesn't feel like anything. It's flat, dust. You got no emotional anything going on. You're just like, blah. And then you think, man, I am the biggest loser ever. And so your spiritual life rises and falls based on your performance instead of based on the reality of Christ's victory on the cross. Here's the key. It's not that our behaviors necessarily change that much. Even understanding the gospel as good news, we still strive to know God more fully through his word. We strive to get closer to him through prayer. We strive to love God and love neighbor the way scriptures instruct us to do. The difference is the motivation is completely different. Instead of striving in that direction for God's love, if I do these things well, God will love me and I will be a Christian in good standing and I will feel good about myself and my self-esteem will rise. See, instead of doing it for approval, we do it from approval. We do it from his love. We do it from that fact, that good news, that announcement that God has won the victory that he has provided through Jesus Christ. When the disciples come back after healing and teaching in the gospels, Jesus sends them out, 70 of them, and gives them power to cast out demons. And they're so excited. They come back and they say, it worked. <laughs> I mean, we, we preached the gospel in your name. And there were times when there was a de- And we said, out. And the demon was out. And they're so excited. And Jesus says, we just missed this. It's an amazing truth. Here's how Jesus responds to that. He says, don't be excited about that. Be excited that your names are written in the book of life. The greatest miracle is salvation given to us freely, open-handedly, through the work of Christ on the cross. The greatest miracle is that good news. Lean into the word. Lean in like those angels. What is God going to do? We are frail, broken people who cannot save ourselves. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to save us. He's going to do the saving. So that the gospel is this announcement of not what must happen, but what has happened. And we live in response to that good news. Even repentance, Romans 2, 4 says the reason we repent is because the kindness of God revealed. Think about that. Repentance itself, Paul says in Romans 2, 4, this is why you repent. Not because the preacher says, repent. Not because we paint this picture of, here's the consequences of your sins. Romans says the reason we repent is because we get a glance of that gospel, that euangelion. We see the kindness of God revealed through the work of Christ on the cross. We see that kindness and that beauty, that kindness of God turns us toward him. That's repentance. We're drawn to the beauty of God's open-handed, gracious love. And so the way we live in this world, and we do it imperfectly, I, I fail every day. Thank God his mercies are new every morning because I need them every morning. But we strive to live as gracious, open-handed people who aren't out giving advice, but instead are living out of that reality of the good news, living out of that reality of the love where we're open-handed 
and free spirits. I fail because I always want to give people advice. Can you relate to that? I mean, I always, here's how I can't believe you. And, and instead, I'm called to live. To, can you imagine how transformative it would be to our own lives and the world's perception of the church if their experience of Christians in the church was this constant, gracious, non-judgmental, open-handed people who stand in the confidence and the joy of God's love and the security of the salvation that God provides through Christ on the cross in that wonderful good news. We stand in that. And because of standing in that, we have this confidence, this ability to love others open-handed and freely. And we don't have to get them to jump through certain hoops. And we don't have to say, but they're not doing the things that they should. I, how am I supposed? We just get to trust the Heavenly Father the way Christ did and love others. And trust that they'll be drawn to the beauty of that love. Nobody's drawn to the beauty of advice. Listen, advice can be good and wonderful. I'm not down on advice. Advice can be tremendously helpful. We need lots of advice, just not necessarily unsolicited advice. 1 Peter 3.15 says, be ready to give an answer for the hope you have. Ready to give an answer means you've got to ask a question. And so how beautiful it would be if we were living our lives out of that confidence of God's love so that we could walk in joy, that we could walk in trust, and we could be that presence, that Wonderful aroma, as Paul says in his letters, of Christ's presence to others. We want to be that euangelion to others. Worthy of every song we could ever see.
Father, we just, we, this would be our prayer this morning, Lord, that you would just be with us as we go through our week. And no matter what we're doing through our week, we just get back into our schedules, Lord, but just remind us, remind us of what your purpose is for us. And that we would be able to see your will, we would be able to hear your voice, and that we would say yes every time. And so we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence, your glory, everything that you are, Lord. We just thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. You are wonderful. So we just commit ourselves to you once again. Be with us this week. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. All right, you guys have a wonderful week. Be filled with the Lord.